Um, I'd like to introduce our first presenter for today. Mike George is what I describe as a modern day mystic, whose roles include best selling author, spiritual teacher, mentor, and facilitator. <laughs> I would describe him as a prolific writer. Earlier today, when we were having a quick conversation, he said that he is always writing. His books include Don't Get Mad, Get Wise, The Seven Ahas of Enlightened Souls, In the Light of Meditation, Learn to Find Inner Peace, and 1001 Meditations, 1001 Ways to Relax. I have to say that I was so inspired by his books that it was only yesterday that I realized I had two copies of the same book with different covers by Mike George on myself that I thought were two different books. That was how good his stuff is. I hadn't even realized. I'd love you to give a warm round of applause to Mike George. It's uh, not a small topic, and so I'll go straight into it and, and really just um, share a little bit of um, how I see um, the Holy Grail, the Holy Grail of all human life, really. It sits behind everything that we do, everything we desire, everywhere we go, everything we acquire is really motivated um, by the search, the never-ending, eternal search for happiness. Um, and I think um, because of the context this afternoon, it's useful just to start by, by sharing my own perspective in that happiness is primarily a state of spiritual being. It's a state of being where I'm aware of myself uh, as spiritual, or maybe I should say spirit is better. That sounds easy in theory, easy in words, but it's not so easy in the day-to-day, moment-to-moment life where we're faced not so much with um, spiritual experience, but we're having to deal with very, very challenging physical experiences. Work, play, travel, money, bills, all the external things that crowd into our life. And they all distract us from our primary state of being, which is a spiritual state, and the primary state of the spiritual state is, for me, uh, one of happiness. However, we tend to use that word in many different ways, in many different instances, to describe many different experiences. And maybe not experiences, but experiences. So to set the ground, for me, happiness is a state of being, and it's a state of being that I will feel. However, when we start talking about our feelings, then we start using words to describe what we feel, and everyone uses words in different ways, and every word is a different meaning for a different person. So it's quite a difficult topic to actually talk about <laughs> to someone else. <clears throat> um, uh, and, and so for me, as I look at my feelings, if I explore my feelings when I've been happy, when I am happy, I notice I'm starting to use different words to describe different feelings in my happy state. And for me, there are uh, three primary feelings that I feel when I'm in a happy state. And when I look into those feelings, I go in with my question, and I'm going to share some questions with you today that you can take away and you can play with that may help you explore your feelings. But when I look into these feelings, then I'm left with the question, what is it that is sustaining this particular feeling? And for me, there are three primary feelings. They kind of fit together in, as a matrix in, in my states of happiness. And, and the first one, and see if this works for you. See if I can invoke this um, as I speak about it. See if you can invoke from your own inner state of being this feeling. And, and the first feeling is the feeling of contentment. For me, this is the deepest form of happiness. 
And when I'm content, um, I notice, when I ask the question, how am I able to sustain my state of contentment, is that I'm not touched by anything. I'm not affected by anything. I'm not affected by anyone that's going on around me, outside me. And if I go right into the, the, the state of contentment, I notice that if I'm going to sustain it, ultimately, I have to accept everyone and everything as they are, as it is, at every moment. Simply because the moment I move into a state of non-acceptance, disapproval, the moment I allow myself to be affected by anything around me, then my state of contentment disappears. If I go a little bit deeper, um, I might recognize that um, ultimately I'm responsible for that state. I'm responsible for all states that I feel. And that for many people is a little bit challenging. It's a little bit of a bridge too far, a mountain too high sometimes. Um, but most people, they understand the theory of that, that no one else is making me ultimately feel happy or unhappy. If I believe they are, then discontentment is inevitable. So this is the first feeling in the multi-layered, multi-dimensional, multi-textured thing called happiness. The second is the state of joy, joyfulness. And I, I don't know if you, if you have a memory or, or maybe, maybe not even a memory. Maybe right now you're in such a state of tremendous joyfulness. As I look out across your faces, probably not. <laughs> and joy, joy for me is, is noticed in my experience when I'm in the process of something. And when I look in and ask the question, what is the process? I notice it's in the process of being creative. And, and, and having explored creativity for, for many, many years, I also kind of noticed that this might just be the primary impulse of the human spirit, is, is to be creative. It's the one thing we're all doing all the time. You're doing it right now, even as you look at me, and even when you're looking straight through me. Uh, you're also doing it because you are thinking. And you think, and therefore you create. Uh, and so the deepest impulse of the human spirit is to create. And the deepest level of creation is to create our own state of being. And, and so joy for me is felt when I'm in the process of being creative. If you ask the mundane level of creatives, the painter, the painter, the, the poet, and, and, and even the writer, they'll tell you there's a great joy in the creative expression that, that they're using to bring something together, to manifest something in the world. And, and you'll notice that joy is present also because you lose awareness of the passing of time. You know, when you're in a joyful state, you notice you never look at one of these. Time, you become oblivious to time. In fact, whenever you look at one of these, it usually means you want to be somewhere else. So I'm watching. <laughs> so, so joy, in, in essence, is, is, is the, the feeling that arises when, when we're doing what's natural to us, which is to be creative. Different levels of creativity. That's probably another seminar. And the third feeling, primary feeling state, when I'm in a state of happiness, is bliss. And I don't mean blissed out as in on, on some drug or, or having had a few too many. But, but I don't know if you've ever noticed in the summer, I always like to watch starlings in the summer. And, and you, you look out into the forest and the starlings, they're flying, the young ones are flying and they're squeaking, they're squealing with just this tremendous blissfulness. And it's as you can almost hear it in their squeals and their squeaks. Um, because they're learning to fly, yes, but they're actually experiencing this tremendous freedom 
Yeah, and, and, and so when the human spirit is truly free, then this feeling of blissfulness is what arises in my experience. I can't say I've, I've lived a long time in that feeling or, or for a long time in any one of those feelings, but I know those feelings um, at some stage in my own experience. So I have a little theory about happiness, and, and I think happiness as a state of consciousness is our most natural state. I don't think that's new. Um, and and, and I, I kind of liken it to water. Uh, and, and, and today we're very, very um, focused on the quality of our water. I was reading the other day that, that water apparently, even just our tap water, has seven different pollutants, toxins, which are compromising the quality, the naturalness of our water. Uh, I'm sure you're, many of you are familiar, you know, I think it's some um, chlorine and fluoride and, and uh, pharmaceutical drugs that are in there somewhere, and there's even radioactive materials if you look closely enough, and there's heavy metals and so on. It, 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 and so we're very conscious nowadays about the quality of our water and an attempt to restore our water to its most natural, cleanest, purest state. Spend a lot of money on purification. And, and so as I look into my consciousness, my sense is that it's as if we all, like water, start pure. Just like that water that falls from the clouds, it's pure natural H2O. And then as soon as it hits the ground, it starts to be polluted by what's in the ground, what's in the environment. And I sense for us it's similar with our consciousness, is that our natural state is pure, like water. Um, free of all toxin, free of all, all compromised by nothing. And when we're in that natural state, um, which I think we do taste sometimes, we feel those kinds of feelings, that contentment, that blissfulness, that joyfulness. And I think we say, well, oh, it was lovely. That was, I felt so natural. I felt so easy in those moments. And then like water, I think for me what happens is that there are specific toxins that get into our consciousness which compromise our naturalness, our purity, and therefore compromise our feelings. <laughs> and as I look into my own consciousness, and, and we can only all only do this for ourselves, and no one else can, can, can do this. This is the, the whole principle of awakening spiritually or, or changing my state of being is that I have to see for myself. I have to look in and, and see what's going on for myself. All the words up here, all the gurus, the seminars, the books, uh, none of them can do it for us, can do it for me. I have to really look inside and see. As I look inside and see, I, I see a variety of different toxins which are compromising the purity, the quality of me, actually, of me. Because consciousness is not separate from me. It is what I am. So take a moment to be aware, and I noticed I am the one who is being conscious. I am consciousness. And I sense that over time, these toxins have crept in. And it's the effect of these toxins which is compromising and diminishing my feelings of happiness. So I'm going to share with you now what I believe are the, some of you won't be surprised at this, the seven key toxins that I also believe every human being carries to some extent or other. At least that seems to be my experience as I talk and chat and interact with people. And as I share each one of these toxins, then I'm also going to, in, in the, the, the spirit of the day, share with you what I think are the best questions to ask yourself. Uh, I can't coach anyone else until I do a bit of self-coaching. And self-coaching means asking myself, 
uh, the right questions, and then being really aware of the answers that arise within sign, uh, within myself. And so the, the 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 toxins all have one thing in common. They are all of the same thing, if it is a thing, and it's called belief. Yeah, the toxins that we absorb are the beliefs that we absorb on our journey through life. And the, the first toxin, toxin number one, the first toxic belief that we absorb is that happiness is something that is acquired. And we have to acquire happiness. This is why we have uh, virtually the whole human race now in, in a state of continuous I want, I want this, I want that, give me this, give me that, I want, I want, I want, desire basically. Because we've learned to believe that we have to acquire something or someone or some place in order to be happy. This is why half the human race is continuously on the move. Do you ever sit by the motorway and watch, where is everyone going? Why is everyone on the move? Then I have to be honest, and I think, well, where am I going? What am I going towards to try and acquire? And so for me, um, happiness is an acquisition, it is proved to be wrong, a wrong belief, if there are such things as correct beliefs, um, when actually in my own experience or inexperience, I notice that when I do acquire the object, the person, the place, then I do have a little high, but it's usually followed by a... I think we all know that in our experience. And so, actually, the upper that, uh, that is experienced when we acquire something is short-lived, it's temporary, and actually, it's stimulated from outside in. It's not coming from within my own state. It's not my creation. So all those are the signals that acquiring something is not going to bring me happiness. But I kind of think you all know that's pretty true now. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here. So the key question to ask myself, if I'm going to do a bit of self-coaching, might be, what is it that I believe is going to make me happy when I acquire it? What do I believe I need to acquire to make me happy? And then all you do is make a little list. Be very honest with yourself, make a little list. And then you have a question underneath that, which says, am I sure? Are you sure? And then if you live in the question, if you live in, that, in your consciousness, you might also come to a realized conclusion, no, acquiring stuff doesn't actually make me content, joyful, and blissful. It does the opposite if I'm really aware of my feelings. Toxic belief number two is that um, happiness is an achievement. Happiness is an achievement. We've seen a whole industry in the past 10, 20 years uh, explode onto our bookshelves, our seminars, our computers, and it's all based on you have to have clear goals to achieve something valuable in your life. And so the whole process of goal setting is driven by the belief that I need to achieve my goals before I can be happy. And so we drive and we strive and we struggle towards our goals and I think you probably know the, the answer to the next question. When you achieve your goal, yes, there is a little moment of something, but then what happens next? I'm off on another journey, I'm off with another goal, I'm off with another aim, I'm off with another picture. And so, in a sense, achievement is always in the future, it's always in the future. And I think we have the happiness of Guru, the Guru of happiness here, the happiness of Guru. The Guru of happiness here today is going to tell us exactly why happiness is not in the future. But I think you already know, happiness can only be now, can only be now. So this belief creeps in and it has us struggling and striving and delaying our happiness for, well, maybe a whole lifetime. So the question to ask myself is, 
What is it that I believe I need to achieve in order to be happy? Make a list. What do I need? What do I believe I need to achieve in order to be happy? A little list and then ask myself, reflect for a moment, look deeply, are you sure? Am I sure this is what's going to make me happy? Toxic belief number three, um, in my experience, definitely my life experience to this point, is that happiness equals excitement. And we learn this when we're very young, when mum and dad take us to the first circus or the first football match, and they look down and they say, isn't this exciting? Aren't you happy and excited? I'm so happy and excited. And we look, oh, this is exciting. Isn't it? I'm happy and excited. And in this moment, we absorb the toxin that excitement equals happiness. And it's as much a linguistic thing. It's when we get uh, all our feelings and words and meanings, they all get mixed up. And so for the rest of our life, many of us believe that we have to be excited in order to feel happy. There is a thrill, there is a high, but we then call that happiness. But if I take a moment to reflect, I notice that excitement is what happens in the kettle when the water boils. The molecules are agitated. And, and if I really reflect for a moment, is agitation, is that happiness? Am I happy when I'm agitated? I don't think so. I think happiness for a human being is not agitation, excitement. It is this contented state and this natural flow of joy into the world. So, the self-coaching question to try and help me free myself from the toxin, this particular toxin, is what is it I believe I need to make me excited that brings me happiness? What is it that I believe that makes me excited and brings me happiness? Make a list. Are you sure? Am I sure? Toxic belief number four is um, the belief that happiness is a dependency. Yeah. That I essentially need someone else to be happy. I need to depend on someone or something to create my state of happiness. And uh, this drives probably just about every dating site, marketing department, uh, magazine, romantic section of the bookstore, um, is the whole idea that I need someone else. I need to be dependent before I can be happy in myself. And again, I think it's pretty obvious that Actually, when you become dependent on anything or anyone, anywhere, anytime, then all dependency leads to some form of addiction. And addiction, whether it is to a person or a place, is always going to bring me not happiness, but some kind of unhappiness. It's always going to sabotage my state, my feeling state inside. So the self-coaching question here is, what do I believe I need to be dependent on to make me happy. Who do I believe I need to be dependent on to make me happy? <laughs> Who am I dependent on that I believe makes me happy? Is that true? Is that true? Are you sure? <clears throat> and then toxic belief number five is happiness is an attachment. Happiness is an attachment. And uh, I guess this kind of underpins most of these beliefs because they all come into some level of attachment or other. But if you walk any spiritual path, if you take any spiritual philosophy or spiritual wisdom, just about everyone will say, you cannot be happy if you're attached to anything. And the reason basically is the F word, not that word. <laughs> Where there's attachment, there must be some fear. Fear of loss, fear of damage. And so if I notice when I'm attached to anything, and this is such an important area of self-awareness, the moment I become attached to anything, I create some form of fear, tension, anxiety, worry, whatever word you want to put to it. And it's good to put words to these feelings that I have. And I'll notice that when I'm scared, am I happy? I don't think so. I think when I'm scared, 
I'm sabotaging my happiness. But that's a problem because the other toxic belief that sits underneath that still has its power, and that power is it's not me that's making me unhappy, it's them, it's someone else. Toxic belief number six is happiness is relief from pain. Happiness is relief from pain. Oh, the toothache is gone, I'm so happy. <laughs> And so we call these moments happiness, but actually it's not real happiness, it's just relief. And when I am relieved of some suffering or some pain, then it's a mistake to believe, to call that feeling happiness. Then if I do that, then I'm always waiting for some relief to feel happy. And then I go searching for something to relieve my suffering, my pain, at whatever level that may be. And then toxic belief number seven is um, maybe the most prevalent, most powerful. Happiness is success. Yeah, is, is, is that true? Happiness is success. When we believe happiness is success and we look around the world and we learn to believe the world is a competitive environment, then it's easy to start feeling I've got to compete, I've got to win, I have to be successful before I can feel happy within myself. The magazines and the movies, they all show us glowing, successful and therefore happy people, and we equate the two, success equals happiness. So we spend our life chasing some kind of success, believing we can't be happy until we're successful. So, coaching question, what do I believe I need to be successful at before I can be happy? Make a list, ask yourself, are you sure, is that true? And so these are not just seven, there's probably 77 little toxic threads that, that have infiltrated our consciousness and that sabotage our state of being, our ability to be content, to be joyful, and to feel that blissfulness inside. And, and so for me, the, the process of spiritual awakening is raising my awareness to the presence of these toxins. And just like we spend a lot of time and energy purifying our water, I need to free myself, purify my consciousness from these little beliefs. And that means waking up and seeing, ah, that's what's sabotaging. That's what's making me feel unhappy miserable, suffer, whatever word you want to put to a feeling that is not contented. It's good. So I'm just a bit aware of time. Um, um, are we okay? Are we doing all right? So if we could quickly so pause so there again. Yeah. We've done our 25 minutes. Okay. So I really hate to stop you there because no, it was no, don't hate, brilliant. just stop. It's a fantastic, it's fine. not a good word. Sorry, it's happy. Okay. If we're happy. <laughs> yeah, but that was wonderful. Okay. And before I say our thank yous, I'd like to open it out and invite some questions. I'm sure there are plenty of questions. We've got some roving mics in the room. Just show yourselves, please. Not me though. I'm not roving. Not yet. Just indicate if you have a question. Yeah. So, do you, can you wait for the mic, or will you I'm be? Lovely. Thank you. Um, my name is John. First of all, thank you very much. I think it's really interesting. Mm. I'm really new to this, so that's hands up number one. Sure. But I found that I did find that really interesting. But everything you're saying there is not happening. It mm. appears to be sort of temporary states that, that we see. So therefore, would you say that you're saying that a capitalist model cannot be a happy model um, for, for people? Yeah. <laughs> You've got a minute to answer that, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the, what I've described really is what we absorb, it's what we've learned. Um, it's, it's not really coming from 
a particular political state or a particular paradigm that has been created by others outside. It, 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 it's really something that we create within ourselves and we nurture and we sustain within ourselves. I learn it, uh, and, and, and if I learn anything, I can unlearn it. So really what you're asking is, can I unlearn these toxic beliefs and still live in the world as you see it? And my answer to that would be yes, for sure. Is that, that your state of consciousness is not dependent on the current paradigm, political or otherwise, around you. And, and if you look in the past 10 or 15 years, you've seen more and more people realizing that is that I can live in the paradigm, I can play the game of the paradigm, and when you wake up spiritually, you realize it really is just a game, uh, and, 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 and I can live in that, and I can awaken within that, and be free of that, free of not needing to bow down to it, to pay tribute to it, to, to buy into it. Um, and it is possible, but... Um, <laughs> and there's the big but. I, I, need to, I need to do my inner work first. I, I need to wake up first within myself. And to do that, I have to let go of everything around me for a while. Is to not even think about what they're doing, what they're doing, what the model is, what the paradigm is, what the politics is. I've got to let go of all of that for a little while at least. And, 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 and restore a different way of seeing, a different way of being from inside out. And then when you do that, then when you look outside, it, the world looks like a, a very different place. Thank you. Can we take another question? Every Save Lovely, you no questions. thank you. That's fine. No questions. No. Um, really, it's, it's mainly based on this happiness for achievement be and the journey. Mm. Because in a set, it's probably the definition of a journey, because we all sense that in trying to find who our true self is, is mm. a bit of a journey. Mm. So it's a contradiction yeah. there. So what, um, and some would say that maybe once we're achieving what we meant to achieve, yeah. what is our best you know, the rolling life, how else can I put it? So I'm trying to be brief. So. No, it's good. It's a good question. I get the question. Okay. In essence, you can't achieve yourself. Yeah, if you want to keep it really short, you cannot achieve yourself. You cannot even go on a journey to find yourself. You don't need to go anywhere because you're, you're always here. <laughs> I'm always here. It's a lovely title. Wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. But the habit of looking, the habit of searching is just one of those habits that we've developed. Is the, the belief system that you have to search and go on your spiritual journey and the pilgrimage and the great quest and the, the metaphor of the mountain and the highest state. For me, I, I'm not saying it's nonsense, I'm saying it's non-sense. It doesn't make sense from a spiritual point of view. But it takes a little time to realize that. I don't go anywhere, I'm always here. I can't even see myself. I'm the one who's looking. That's when it gets very interesting. Yeah, I'm the one who's aware of being aware, therefore I am just awareness. And so I'm aware that I'm looking. And there it is. Here I am. Here I am. That's all. And when you Find that, there's the word find, see I'm already in the language. <laughs> when you're in that state, then all the search ends, you don't look anywhere, and you don't try and be anything other than being yourself right now. And that's the ultimate contentment for me. Enough? Thank you Fantastic. so Thank much. You but don't, much. before you leave, I just want okay. to say one Thing okay. to you. I mean, I think that was a perfect place to leave us at. We okay. will be coming back after tea break um, to talk some more with some questions. But here I am is a very poignant place for us to pause at. And I wanted to thank you for your ability to take an, an issue that has, as you described, multi-layered dimensions 
and complexity and bring a bit like the water in the glass that you're holding, crystal clear clarity in terms of how you break things down, the metaphors, the images, the examples that you use, and really help us to really allow this whole big issue about happiness to sit with us and just the great six key toxins and the self-coaching questions that you've shared with us in such a short time. Thank you so Pleasure. much, Mike Thank George. You. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Robert Holden, who is one of the world's leading coaches, coaching leaders in business, education, politics, and healthcare. Mike has already described him as the guru of happiness. He has this amazing ability to take you from the dark to the light in a way that you will appreciate in a moment. In 1995, Dr. Holden was responsible for starting up the Happiness Project. And before I even met him, I'd watched the program on happiness that he did with the BBC and QED. And was really kind of, you know, he was a pioneer before we really, really went into the language of happiness in the way that we are talking about it now. The key happiness signature programs are the eight-week happiness course, coaching happiness, and success intelligence. Robert is a well-loved, well-established speaker and has shared the screen with the likes of Oprah, Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chopra, Ken Blanchard, Paul McKenna, so many people to mention. He has an impressive range of books, including Happiness Now, Shift Happens, Success Intelligence, Be Happy, and his latest publication, Lovability. Can you give a warm round of applause and welcome to Robert Holden. So, um, this is my first uh, visit to Global Cooperation House. Have I said that right? Global Cooperation House. So, it's very lovely to be here. It's not my first contact with the Brahma Kumaris. I think it must have been something like 1990 when I took um, 10 classes um, in, in meditation. I remember the man who introduced me to the BK philosophy and to meditation was a man called Don, Don Fulcher. And um, he said that uh, we would get together at 4 o'clock, which sounded good until I realized it was 4 a.m. and not 4 p.m. <laughs> Are you sure, I said, are you really, really sure? 4 p.m. seems so good, but it was 4 a.m. And um, I remember after the first uh, couple of lessons, we went and played golf together. And he beat me by 26 shots, which is quite a lot. <laughs> and uh, I didn't play well that day. I couldn't get the ball off the ground. So I basically putted all the way around the course, pretty much. And um, then we did a couple more classes, and then we played golf again. And I beat him by 26 shots. So that was a swing of 52 shots. And I remember him saying that he thought the work of Brahma Kumaris was good, but he didn't realize it was that good. <laughs> and uh, so it really helped my golf, you know, in a big way. Um, so I'd been aware of the work of Brahma Kumaris over the years. Um, I have a great love of, of yoga. My first spiritual teacher was an Indian man who introduced me to some of the yogas, uh, particularly of India. Um, Bhakti yoga, the yoga of love and devotion, is what I've been writing about most recently in a book called Lovability. So it's just to say I feel very um, at home here and uh, very grateful that I have been invited to be part of uh, this afternoon's conversation. And it is a great conversation and it's a great title and there's several bits that I would like to address and uh, respond to as well um, in terms of also what Mike has covered. And uh, to echo Jackie's words, I think there's it it was a huge amount actually distilled, perfectly distilled in such a short period of time. So, um, 
I think I might start with the, um, the challenging times bit, because I've just come back from um, a month with my family in, um, in America, where we were just helping to um, support a PBS show over there called Shift Happens, based on one of my books. And on that PBS show, I began with this quote. And this is just to test your um, knowledge of English literature. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. <laughs> it was the age of wisdom, and it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity, toxic beliefs. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, and it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, and we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, and we were all going direct the other way. And that's from Tale of Two Cities, yeah, Charles Dickens. And... Um, Gosh, you know, written, what, nearly 150 years ago. Uh, the story, nearly 250 years ago, I think. Um, and yet, like all great literature, great literature has this capacity somehow to touch the moment, but somehow also be timeless. And uh, I remember when I first read those words, I thought to myself, my goodness, you know, he could so easily have been talking about today and uh, the state of the world today and where we appear to be at. We forever seem to be at a choice point, personally, uh, but also collectively. So I just want to acknowledge that I think, you know, it seems that there are always challenging times. It seems to be part of the journey, part of the human journey that we do face challenges. Right now, I think we are experiencing what I call the death of normal. Um, just when we thought we knew what normal is, it isn't that way anymore. And we are being asked to grow and evolve, perhaps faster than ever before. I don't mind that we're mourning the death of normal, because I don't think the normal that was normal actually served so many people that well. I think it's time for a better normal. And there are so many wonderful things that haven't happened on this planet that could happen if we were to be more true to who we are and we had the courage to really go for it and show up in the world in a way that we really can. So, against the backdrop of the challenging times, we have the challenge of happiness and, and how to be happy. So, on that note, I thought I might... Um, in an effort to, just like Mike did, just to explore terms. And it is important to do this. You know, running the Happiness Project, one of the things I learned really early on is just because we're using the same word, it doesn't mean we're talking about the same thing. And I think it's really helpful, really helpful to be able to just sit and, and as Mike said, not just think about, but actually feel contentment, joy, bliss. Uh, pleasure, satisfaction, what does all of this really mean? How does this really touch us? And with all, within all of this, what is the, the real happiness? So um, this is uh, something that I wrote a few years ago, and I called it the big happiness. And I'll often share this when I'm, creating, when I'm running the eight-week program, often at the beginning of the eight-week program, and here's how it goes. I am interested in the big happiness. The big happiness that is with me now. A happiness that is bigger than my name. A happiness that is bigger than your name. A happiness we share and that is the same. I follow the way of the big happiness. The big happiness that is with me wherever I go. A happiness that is my guide. A happiness that is my light a happiness that sees me through the day and night. I live in the big happiness, the big happiness that breathes life into me, a happiness that is solid ground, a happiness that does not come or go, a happiness I feel when I'm in the flow. 
I give myself to the big happiness. The big happiness that holds me when I cry. A happiness that finds me when I'm lost. A happiness that loves me well again. A happiness that makes me whole again. It is the big happiness that I love. A big happiness that does not wobble when I am low. A happiness that is not up, nor down, nor temporarily so. A happiness more honest than the stories we tell. A happiness that tells us, I know you, and I love you, and all is well. So that's called the big happiness. And I guess that was really my attempt to touch a happiness that isn't just the absence of sadness. You know, it strikes me that so often we're introduced to happiness as the opposite of something. So it's the opposite of pain, it's the opposite of sadness. And yet I felt that duality, which seems to be one of the keynotes of the consciousness of humanity, we seem to divide everything up, um, there is an essential oneness that exists before and after duality. And I feel there is a happiness that is somehow not the absence of sadness. There is a happiness that actually helps us to handle our sadness, that helps us to handle our pain. And I think that's the happiness I've been most interested in. And um, it's not pleasure. Pleasure is a happiness of the senses, which is a wonderful, lovely thing. But too much pleasure usually leads to a headache of one description or another. So there's an opposite. It's not satisfaction, because satisfaction usually is the type of happiness that comes from a because, for all of the reasons that Mike's outlined, and another 70 more. Uh, there's a happiness that is what I like to refer to as an unreasonable happiness. And this unreasonable happiness doesn't seem to need a reason. This happiness, as Mike has really showed us, is not an it, it's not something to be acquired, it's not an achievement. It's, I would say, not even a state of mind. And I, as listening to Mike, I mean, Mike's saying that, you know, happiness, a state of being, a state of spiritual being, I think was the words you used. For me, that's, that's my experience of true happiness. That happiness is not a state of mind. There are states of mind that can help you to access that happiness, which is a state of spiritual being. Gratitude is a state of mind that can access it. Uh, forgiveness is. But actually, happiness is just you. It's your being. Uh, the way I put it in, in a book called Be Happy is that happiness is you minus your neurosis. So it's just you when you're not being neurotic. Um, my first spiritual teacher, the Indian gentleman who, who I met, he offered to teach me the secret of happiness one day, which was very nice of him. So I said, yes, uh, what is it? And he, you know, this was a long time ago now, but he said the secret to happiness is to know that you're already happy. And I remember saying to him, God, that's fabulous. That's such good news. Why don't I feel it? <laughs> and I guess one of the reasons why you, know, you could say that I didn't feel it is because the, the toxins were in there. Those toxic beliefs were in there. So I think really, just to clarify terms, I think happiness is us. It's our true nature. Now, after that, we can have some fun when I was studying psychology, I often reminisce on this, I studied for six years psychology, sociology, and philosophy. We didn't have a lecture on happiness. Well, actually we did. We had one lecture on happiness. And it was uh, called Subjective Wellbeing, which doesn't sound very happy. <laughs> um, it's quite clever, actually, Subjective Wellbeing. It's, uh, because basically it means that when, um, according to some psychologists, if you were to go and visit a psychologist and you were to say you're happy, they're going to translate that as subjective well-being. So they're thinking you just think you're happy. <laughs> now we've got some work to do, you know. 
But basically, we, you know, we did a sort of a lecture on subjective well-being, and it wasn't great, I have to be honest. Um, and after that training, I did wonder, why hadn't we studied happiness more? And I think, on reflection, one of the reasons why we hadn't studied happiness more was because we had never really asked ourselves, what's the purpose of happiness? Happiness has been described, and I quote, as a pleasurable emotion with no evolutionary value. So it's nice, but it doesn't really have any point. That's probably a reason why we didn't study it in our syllabus. Um, but on the program, the eight-week program, and the five-day course that I lead, I love to address this question, what is the purpose of happiness? Because I actually do believe that happiness um, has a purpose. And ultimately, I think the purpose of happiness is to help you to be authentic and to be true to yourself. And in challenging times, I think one of the greatest things we can do is to work out for ourselves what authenticity means and how we could be true to ourselves. And when you're faced with the greatest challenges, to be able to sink inside yourself and make access to that place in you that knows, to that wisdom in you that is part of your spiritual DNA, and to ask yourself, how can I be true to myself today? What could I do that could be truly helpful in this challenging time? Well, I believe happiness is trying to show you how to be authentic. And the reason I think like that is because I have noticed that when people are authentic, they are naturally happy. They're not trying to be happy, they're just naturally happy. When we are inauthentic, we often feel unhappy. That's the purpose of unhappiness. Unhappiness is just trying to show us where we could be being more authentic. This is just one of the purposes, I believe, of happiness. But I think it's an important one. So, the purpose of my work with the Happiness Project, ultimately, is to help people to give up the search for happiness so that they can follow their joy. Two completely different paradigms. The search for happiness, as we, we've heard from Mike, really, is you know, it's based on an idea that it's not here. You're only going to search for something if you think it's not here. Or also if you think it's in the future. Following your joy is a whole other proposition. Can you feel the difference just even in the words? Searching for happiness, can you feel how that somehow feels future tense? It's, a future, it's outside of myself and it's future tense. And then following your joy, well that's a whole other thing. Following my joy, that doesn't sound future tense. That feels like I'm being asked to follow something that's already here. To pay attention to something that's already here. And this isn't about becoming something, this is about being, and it's about being, I believe, in a way, what we already are. And the key is to do that now. Not after the challenging times are over, which is often, you know, what we do is we say, my God, you know, when these challenging times are over, then I'll look after myself. You know, then I'll get back to doing my yoga. Then I'll get back to my meditation. You know, then I'll stop eating crisps for dinner. You know, <laughs> it's like, but what we are asked to do is actually to do that now, in the middle of the challenging times. Happiness now. Most of the times, you know, our, our ego believes in the idea of now. It's just waiting for a better now before we do it all. You know, but it's like, no, now, in the middle of the challenging times. So that, for me, is really the, the heart of the work, helping people to follow their joy. Now, when we do run into those challenging times, I think if we really pay attention to them, I think we will notice, and this is what I've noticed personally, is that, and this is, I'm just going to throw out an idea to you, see how this lands. But what I've learned for myself is that there is no such thing as a dark night of the soul. When I pay attention to myself in the middle of a challenging time, what I can feel when I really 
pay attention is that what I call a dark night of the soul is really a dark night of the ego. It's my personality that's going through the trouble. It's my self-image that's rocked. It's my ego that's having the really hard time. And it's actually when I can attend to that suffering of the ego, the self-image, the pain, that amazingly I start to be aware of the big happiness. The support that is there somehow behind the scenes and the support that is offered, I believe, from the soul, uh, from the unconditioned self. So I guess what I've learned is that I honestly do believe that our true self, what I sometimes call the unconditioned self, is always in a state of harmony, in a state of peace and happiness. That is the big happiness. And that in a challenging time, we are called to bring our self-image our ego, our personality, whatever you want to call it, our separate self, our sense of a separate self, we're asked to bring it back to the soul, to the self that we all share, and rest, and take instruction, and have guidance and support along the way. Hmm. And when we do that, then maybe we don't just, we don't fight those challenging times in quite the same way. I mean, everybody's had their fair share of challenging times. And what's awkward about a challenging time is that the one you're in now often feels like the one you're not going to get through. But what I would say is that Who you think you are won't be able to get through that challenging time. But who you really are can and will. And often in challenging times we are asked to come back to ourselves. And to be able to let... Challenging times are asking us to let go of those toxic beliefs. They're asking us to let go of who we think we are so that we can access the truth of who we really are. And I do honestly believe that's one of the great functions of a coach, by the way. A coach is somebody who is not fooled by your appearance. You know, you've been telling them for an hour that you're stuck. And they're tempted to believe you, but they're not going to. Because they know that it could only be the ego that's stuck, the self-image that's stuck. You've been telling your coach for an hour that you've tried everything. And it almost sounds true partly because you believe it, but it would only be the self-image that's tried everything. There's a lot more to try beyond that. Another thing that I think is quite important to consider in challenging times is something that I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw from um, my study of a book called A Course in Miracles. How many of you have come across A Course in Miracles? Okay, I've been a student of A Course in Miracles for about 20 years, um, which means that I've done the lessons daily for 20 years. Um, a Course in Miracles is a psycho-spiritual text and offers a psycho-spiritual approach to life, which seems to be really the age we're in, where more and more great, great uh, teachings are encouraging us not to try to do everything by psychology alone, but to blend psychology and spirituality. And in A Course of Miracles, there's a line which um, I think is pretty good, worth an inquiry. And the, the line is, um, beware of the temptation to perceive yourself as unfairly treated. Beware of the temptation to perceive of yourself as being unfairly treated. In challenging times, it can really feel like the world has it in for you. That somehow you've got singled out and that the world is doing something to you. And not just the world, by the way. It depends on our conditioning. It depends on the toxicity of the beliefs. You know, we may even give this one to God and say that it's God doing this to us. And in my experience, again, when you pay close attention, 
what you will often find is that what the world appears to be doing to you is what you're already doing to yourself. And so in challenging times, we are called upon to look at all of the places and all the ways that we are treating ourselves with a lack of care, a lack of love, a lack of consideration. And part of being true to ourselves is to be able and willing to come back to loving ourselves and saying, okay, well, even if the world does appear to be neglecting me, I won't neglect myself. Even if the world does appear to be rejecting me, I won't reject myself, my true self, my spiritual self. And so in some ways, I think the challenging times are a call for us to, as I say, truly love ourselves and to be a loving presence to ourselves. One last idea, which I think is a personally a great key to happiness, but also uh, worth bearing in mind uh, in challenging times. Um, and I'm going to draw from the book Shift Happens again. There's a, a, a chapter in there. All of the chapters in Shift Happens are based on principles. And the principle is, um, if you are alive, you need help. Okay? If you're alive, you need help. And what I would say is that in my experience, when it comes to challenging times, um, and actually, even when it comes to happiness, ultimately, we are not called to do life by ourselves. Um, often, the great unhappiness is our dysfunctional independence. It's an independence is probably a toxic belief. If we crafted it, it would be something like that in order to be happy, I must do everything by myself. So there's a dysfunctional independence here, which where I've taught myself that I have to do it by myself. And I would say that um, that can often be a great cause of unhappiness in our life. The thought that actually that that's true. One of the reasons why I'm still so interested in happiness after you know, 20 years of, of, of study through the Happiness Project is because I'm convinced that our happiness is our gift to the world. One of the things that I've tracked and enjoyed for so long is how when people are truly happy, one of the great um, expressions of that happiness is an altruism, is a desire to support and encourage the happiness of others. We know we can't make people happy, but we would love to encourage and support it. And so this shows me a, a cooperation, if you like, which is the opposite of a dysfunctional independence. And so once again, in challenging times, when you hear yourself say, I can't handle this, that's true if you mean that your ego can't handle this. It's not true if you are referring to your soul, but when you're referring to your soul, it's no longer an I, it's a we. And we're allowing ourselves to be helped and guided and blessed and inspired along the way. And I do think that's the ultimate key to, to happiness and to challenging times is to be willing to let ourselves be helped. Um, and it's one of the great joys of coaching. And it's why coaching works so well is because even when somebody makes the decision to sign up for coaching, just that, they're already beginning to move out of dysfunctional independence. And when two or more people join in the name of spirit, you will always have a breakthrough. On that note. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. I'm really keen for us to, or for you to ask your questions. Um, just before we take a tea break, and I hand back over to Davina. What's resonated with you? What do you want to ask or say? Can we have the mic over here? Hi. It's, hi, Robert. Hi. Thank you. Um, I follow you, so um, I really On enjoyed your talk. On uh, Facebook? 
um, on Hay House. On the Hay and House. Oh, cool. I can do it conference. Oh, and. great. Yeah, um, thank but you. I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the purpose of the ego? I mean, why do we experience the ego? Uh, yeah, my gosh. <laughs> oh, what's the purpose That's of the everyone. ego? <laughs> yeah, I look. Um, I'm aware of many, many theories because, I've, like you, I've asked the question so often. You know, what's the purpose of it? Um, and the honest truth is, I'm not sure. Really, I'm not sure what the purpose of it is. I know that some of the theories that are out there, it's a little bit like, what's the purpose of adolescence? You know, it's like, it strikes me that it might be a phase we're going through. Um, but I don't ultimately know. What I try to be careful of is I try to be careful of the theories that try to oppose the ego. Because I, in my experience, opposing something doesn't ultimately help you to handle it well. Does that make sense? So I think it's much better that, that if we can, we, we cultivate a sense of acceptance, a loving acceptance, not a resignation, but an acceptance which, where we can sort of say, when we notice the voice of the ego, we can say uh, something like, hello, my old friend. Here you are again. You know, here you are again. So your theory is, I shouldn't talk to that stranger. Your theory is, I shouldn't go for that job interview. Your theory is, I shouldn't, do you know what I mean? And it's like, and every now and then, I, I do think you know, we're entitled to ask that voice, where do you get your information from? Because <laughs> it sounds so real, you know, and true and authoritative. But my experience is, is to bring it, give it some acceptance, not oppose it, try not to make it wrong. Um, and at the same time, you know, if using Freud's definition of the ego, which is, you know, this sense of a separate self, I do honestly believe that our true identity is a shared identity. I, I think, um, you know, in, in the Eastern traditions when we're asked to explore what is real, my understanding of that inquiry or my understanding of the word real means what is uh, beyond time and space? What is changeless about us? And I think it's fair to say the ego is forever adjusting itself, changing, moving around. But there is something amazing when we drop past that. You know, when you ask a question like, who am I without my self-image? It's like, you just drop into this timeless place of, you know, it's, it's, it's dynamic, but the essence of it doesn't change. That that place in us beyond the self-image, it's not, it's not monotone, it's not just one note, there are many notes, and there are many colours, and it's vibrant and fabulous and wonderful. It's, it's interesting, because it's not the excitement, it's not that, but it's got a dynamism to it. And, and yet, somehow, you get a feeling that it's constant, and it's been there forever. Whereas this self-image, at best, can only last as long as this body, can't it? So it's that thing of, oh, who am I without that self-image? So in a nutshell, I think don't oppose it, give it some love, you know, and, and just keep coming back to that shared identity. Yeah, nice one. Good. Yeah. Thank you. So we've got another question over yeah. here. Oh, excuse me, yes. Thanks for your... Is the mic on? Yeah, thanks for your uh, presentation. Um, Thank you. I just you. wanted to take you back to the US when you're talking about your work with PBS. Yeah. Uh, it would be great if you could um, put some feedback to them and say if your program could be made available on DVD because a lot of their programs aren't available yeah. here in the UK. Yeah. But anyway, uh, my question to you is um, we're in a state uh, in the US in particular where it's a real paradox because uh, there was a recent BBC program and, uh, t highlighting the millions of children who are actually living below the poverty line in the US. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of ironic because in, this, in the speech that you've just given, you talk about 
the coach-coachee relationship and the benefit of altruism. Yes. So how did you put that across to Americans? Because, I mean, America is a very individualistic society, but it's yes. actually crying out for the exact opposite. So how did you actually mm. handle that in your presentation, in your program? Yeah, I think it is, it is fair to say. It's, it's a great point that that's a sociological term of the individualistic culture. There does seem to be a trend of uh, more and more countries, particularly as we become urbanized, becoming more and more individualistic at the moment. And we think of ourselves as, as soul identities. Um, and again, I see that as an expression of separation and of separateness. And I honestly do believe that, that fundamentally, if we are to be happy, we have to be willing to let go of what Einstein called the optical delusion of separation. We do have to, we do, have to do that. Um, I think it's a, it's a huge question, and um, one little bit I could just perhaps say is that you can try and create a culture that celebrates positivity, achievement, um, strong, successful images, but if we aren't fundamentally interested in the happiness of each other, we will probably end up creating a culture that is heavily dependent on antidepressants to get through the day. Even though we're achieving a lot and being successful and looking good and making it happen and everything else, we'll need some of those antidepressants to get us through the day. And I would say, you know, fundamentally, not just America, but every country ultimately, I think, is called to address the question of real happiness. Because I do believe, ultimately, when you really, really touch that feeling of true happiness, after that, it just does become your great joy, your great joy to support the happiness of others. I really do believe that. And for that reason, uh, we would be so happy, it's like we would be so happy that we wouldn't want somebody to live homeless tonight. Do you see what I mean? Our happiness just wouldn't allow that to happen. It would, because, I, and, and I believe the real reason for this is because the closer you get to real happiness, uh, the more and more obvious it is to me that what you're really talking about actually probably isn't happiness, it's love. Thank you. Yep. So I, I'm sort of hearing a. Do is it a supplementary, or can we hold it till we come back for the questions after? Well, um, it was <laughs> the question was I, I wonder whether uh, true, you talked about true happiness and very interesting whether that is really the aim of our lives because there are events like in the Second World War where people um, uh, uh, were parachuted into occupied territory. Now, I don't think they were doing it because to make them happy. They were doing it for some other purpose, maybe mm. for justice or maybe to fight an injustice. And I just wonder whether you could um, uh, compare the sort of this, mm. where, what they were doing, which I don't think they were being happy about, or they might have been, I don't know, mm. and what you're saying, true happiness. Mm. I think mm. there can be a, a conflict. Mm. Can I invite us to sit with that over break? It's a good question, isn't it? Should yeah. we have a little break? Can we, can, we, can we sit with it and then we will definitely have more time when we come back? And you may have something maybe that you we, want to say we could yourself both and Mike. It, perhaps. Yeah? Yeah, maybe we, if we something. could ask you to restate the question at the beginning of the... Yeah. I hope we can do that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So before you go, I just want to say to you, Robert... Jackie. I am so <laughs> delighted... <laughs> that you accepted the invitation yeah. to come to the Brahma Kamaris to speak. I want to thank you for your ability to just show up, mm. for your ability to be a loving presence of kindness, generosity, wisdom and insight. I feel like we've gone from going into the ocean, really going underneath and like coming up for air and just seeing what's there in terms of just reminding us that it is all about returning back to ourselves mm. for who we are. Can you thank Robert Holden? Thank you. That's You're lovely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
so much. And welcome back. I hope you all had a lovely tea, and I hope that more questions have percolated and are emerging for our guest speakers today. So we're going to move straight into the questions. So please indicate, put your hands up if you have a question. We're de I'm definitely going to come back to your question that you asked before the break. Um, but before, just a couple of quest new questions from the floor. So we've got someone over here, one person over here. So there's some lady over here in the white. Thank you. And if you could just let us know who your question's for or whether it's to both of our presenters today, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Uh, so my question, I think, is probably to maybe both presenters. Um, it's a bit following on from the thing about the ego and um, I kind of think of the ego like, like the struggling ego and finding a resonant place to take care of it and move from the dysfunctional independent <laughs> Um, and and um, the, in a way, the difference between, say, coaching and therapy and, and how important it is to feel like a real sense of light or yes about the person you're working with and how, how to reach out into the world if you've kind of, um, I don't know, in some ways maybe made lots of, I don't know, you have a strong sense of your unreasonable happiness person, but... Um, yeah, sort of forging a way into a more of a we and, and the therapy come coaching question. Does that make sense? <laughs> I'm wondering a little bit the difference between therapy and, and, and coaching and, and how to feel comfortable about m making moves. Lovely. Thank out. you. <laughs> <laughs> you said you understood it. Yeah, well... <clears throat> it's good when you do that bit first, isn't it? <laughs> it's like you, if you do it second, it just doesn't look so good. You know? <laughs> um, one of the reasons why I was so pleased when coaching appeared, which in my life, that's how it was. It somehow just appeared. It was suddenly something that people were talking about. Um, why I was pleased to join in with coaching is, is because I felt that when I was sitting with somebody and having a conversation with them, what came to me stronger and stronger really is that, is that most people don't really need more therapy, they need more clarity. Huh. Um, in other words, that they're not, they're not broken. They may feel broken, um, but they are not. Um, the essence of who we are is not broken. The self-image can fall apart at any given moment, and that's probably why we feel broken, because we're so identified with the self-image. And then we go, my God, I'm, I need fixing, I need healing, I need, you know, I need therapy. My experience is, is actually is that, as I say, most people just need more clarity, more clarity about who they really are, uh, more clarity about what is important. So, for instance, more clarity about what happiness is, more clarity about the toxic beliefs that I'm putting in the way between me and a happiness that already exists. That experience of greater clarity is incredibly therapeutic and, and therefore very, can feel very healing. Um, but that, for me, is, is one of the reasons why I was really pleased to come and, and join in with the coaching the coaching wagon as such. Um, the other thing that, that I would just emphasize with the coaching, which is what I love the feeling of equality that's in, in the conversation. I believe that that is there in, in many counseling paradigms too. If you take something, for instance, like Carl Rogers' work, you know, where Carl Rogers said, you know, unconditional positive regard for who's in front of you, that's coming from a place of equality. Um, there's an old saying that when the teacher is ready, the student will appear. You know, you may have heard it the other way around. Um, <laughs> but when the teacher is ready, the student will appear. In my experience, often, you know, when the coach is ready, the client will appear. And, yeah. and the client will tell you about something that's going on in their life, and you're there going, how do they know about my life? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. 
you know, is this a joke? You know, are the mm. cameras on me right now? Is this candid mm. camera? Mm. You know, it's extraordinary that they will present something that is absolutely just right up for you in your own life right now. And mm. yeah. Mike, so, do you want to add anything just to a, that? Two little things, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, just a couple of things. Although he's um, Robert sort of ex uh, accentuated this dysfunctional independence, I, I also sense that, that there needs to be a period of complete and utter non-dependency on anyone and anything. And, and the reason for that is um, most of us carry what's called the loneliness chip. Yeah, and in other words, it's very difficult for us to be alone, on our own, with ourself. And, and for me, and my, I only speak from experience, that, that I've spent some really substantial periods on my own. Mm. And, and it's only those periods where I've begun to really see with clarity what the ego is and what it's doing. And that for me is absolutely essential. If you're going to enter the territory of spiritual coaching at any level, call it spiritual, call it coaching, then you need to, un for me, you need to understand how I create the ego. And it's not just the mic is gone. No, it's still here. It wasn't coming through really clear on the mic. Do you want to borrow a mic? Do you want to just check? <coughs> Can I borrow the handheld? Can we borrow the handheld? Thank you. Great. Am I still here? Is it turned on? It's not turned on, Mike, it's I don't think. Little red button on the bottom. See? What were you saying about things turning up to? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Little red button. Here we go. Okay. Lovely. So where was I? Oh, yes. The ego. And so I need to really understand the, the, how the ego is created and how it's ruling uh, my life. Uh, when I talk about it, actually it's not a separate thing. It's, it's a mistake that I make. And, and that mistake for me, and see if you can see this, is when you lose your sense of self in something that you're not. And that takes place in your mind. This is why Robert was talking about that you know, he was indicating the mind is not what I am. I have a mind, but it's not me. And so this is where meditation comes in. And, and you sit and you meditate and you notice, wait a minute, there's me and there's the place where I create thoughts, ideas, images. I bring up my memories, my concepts. That's the mind I bring them into. But the mistake we make is we go into what's on our mind and then we allow that to shape me, to shape the I. That's why transformation means to transcend form, the action, the action of transcending form. I'm allowing an image, it could be any image, it could be this floor, this building, what's in the mirror, any image in the mind, if, it, if I lose myself in it, I take the shape of it. And then anything threatens it, and then I feel threatened. And that's why the ego takes everything personally. So I have to come out of the mind, come back to the center, and this is the practice of meditation and the cultivation of self-awareness as opposed to what's on my mind awareness. Mm. And I t I've got, really got to get that before I can help someone out of that. And that's the essence of spiritual coaching, is getting someone back to their center, to their self. But they have to, see, have to help them see how they're losing themselves. Hundreds of times every day we do this, but we're not aware that we're doing it. So how can I become more aware? Yeah. Meditation, contemplation, these are the practices on my own. There has to be some time, not all the time, not forever. And just to finish, because the essence of the spiritual journey, which, which I always remind myself of, I come naked and I go <laughs> naked. I come naked and I go naked. So get ready to be naked. <laughs> Thank you. Great question. Anyone over this side? Any questions? Lovely, thank you. Oh. Oh. Yes, me? In a moment. Yeah. Uh, so I, if I rephrase the question, what, what, what I was getting at is that um, there are some things, well, I was given the instance of the um, special operations of, of, where they parachuted people into occupied territory in the Second World War. Now, they volunteered. They weren't actually um, uh, conscripted. 
So they volunteered to do something that was very dangerous, mm. could have led to torture, could have led to all sorts of things. And I wondered if, you know, uh, whether the happiness come in, there might be a higher sort of thing than happiness. It might have been that they were thinking of injustice or, or, or some other um, uh, notion. Uh, I don't think the happiness was in their mind when they were doing that. And I just wondered, you know, what you think, both of you, what you think of that uh, idea that people were doing things not because they want to be happy, they were doing it for other reasons. I suppose in there there's also that, that idea of how could happiness be present in those kinds of situations? Mm. Well done. Yeah. It's good. Yay, touche. I think he was waiting for that moment. Fantastic. Um, uh, I missed that one. Um, well, I mean, there's a, a number of answers from me to this question, but I'll throw one out and see how it sits. And, and, and in actual fact, it was happiness that they were um, fighting for the right term or protecting. I don't think it really matters. Um, because the motive uh, that those souls had at that time um, was they believed that they were fighting for the freedom of their country, their people, or whatever. And so that belief basically is the protection of freedom, and that's really a protection of one's happiness. Because without freedom, there is no happiness. That's why I was talking earlier about the bliss of that freedom and that freedom is an intrinsic part of the reconnecting with the big happiness Robert's talking about, but the real freedom has nothing to do with the world outside. The real freedom is that inner freedom where you are attached and dependent on nothing and no one ever. And, and to get to that state, uh, it doesn't require a war. <laughs> uh, it doesn't require flying planes or anything like that. That's another, another, um, another. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can I just quickly grab a question from the gentleman in the brown shirt before we wrap up? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this refer to what Robert said in the, towards the end of his uh, talk. You know, you said, um, when you are in challenging situation or times, uh, you say, I can't handle it on my own, yeah? Mm -hmm. And this is referred to your ego. Now, how do I know this is uh, my ego and self-image saying I can't handle it, or it's, it's uh, the weaker part of me, or the dependency saying I can't do it? Because the reason I'm asking this is because when I said, whenever I say I can't do it, I don't refer to my ego. I say, I don't know everything, so I don't know particularly this thing, so I can't handle it. And how would I know? Is my ego and self-image uh, saying I can't do it, or the weaker part of me saying, you know, I can't do it or I can't handle it? Mm. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> Thank you. I think one of the reasons why we are even interested to go on a spiritual path is because we are aware of what we appear not to know. You know, we, we're running around in a life, busy trying to make it happen, and there's a few bases we haven't covered yet. Like, who am I, for a start? Be pretty good to know, you know? I mean, it's pretty good to know that sort of question when you're filling out a job description or going on a dating site or whatever, you know, who am I? I mean, we feel incredibly compromised often by a question like that. And I think we often will go on a, on a spiritual path, not least to see if we can find out a bit more of who we really are. And we pay attention to ourselves. And part of a spiritual path, I think, is to become discerning enough so that when we refer to I or me, or any personal pronoun, we actually know who we're referring to. So when I say, for instance, I'm not good enough, you know, which self just said that? Really, is that the self that was created by the divine that just said that? Is that the self that creation created? You know, or is that my self-image that's just saying, do you know, I just don't feel good enough today? Or another really good one, I'm not ready. You know, who just said that? 
you know, and, and you know, we pay attention, we find there's this self that's always getting ready. And it's forever getting ready. And it's been getting ready for a really long time. And, and, but when we pay attention to ourselves, we become aware there's this other self that's saying, we're ready. We're, we're really ready, actually. You know, it's like any time you like, we've been ready from the beginning. And it's like, I think it's just paying attention to ourselves, really. It's not an, so I, there's no, not what I'd call an intellectual answer to the question. It would just be to say, sit, be present, bring that desire to know the true self, and then you become, just start to become discerning, you know, and... Um, I mean, for instance, you know, as a student of A Course of Miracles, I, I noticed, and The Course of Miracles helped me to see that often the, the ego, um, it's often a fearful response. I'm afraid that I'm not ready. I'm afraid I'm not good enough. But also that, that, that other voice has more of the qualities of love about it and peacefulness about it. Thank you. you. Know. Mm. So I'm just wondering, we have to wrap up now, so our final question to our presenters oh, today yeah, is, <laughs> what are your three tips and, um, for um, flourishing in challenging times, to be happy and to be able to navigate our way through these challenging times? And I'm just wondering, Robert, if you've actually said your three, which is, you know, to be present, to be discerning. Yes. Oh, he's not getting yes. away with it. Oh, he's not getting away with it. I'm kind of keeping up on the time. <laughs> so nearly. I tried. You nice did. Nice you gave try. me such a great get out there. I, because of course I was going to say yes. So we've got, we've got 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah. All right, 30 seconds. Bum, 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 bum. Number one, have a daily spiritual practice. Yep. Nothing for me. You can't get around that one. It's have a practice where you take time to be with yourself. Um, number two, life doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. So work with it. Work with it. Whatever's happening right now, however challenging it is, work with it. And number three would be read one of Mike's books to help you. <laughs> And we know what's coming next, don't we? <laughs> 30 seconds, Mike. Thank no, you, we Robert. Don't, we don't do business here. <laughs> nice try. Uh, yeah, for me, meditation. Absolutely yeah. every day, not once or twice a year. And, <laughs> and, and meditation, is stroke reflection, really. That If you combine the two. Uh, yeah. And then the second uh, an aphorism is, what's in the way is the way. Yeah. What's in the way is the way. So ask yourself every day, what's in the way? And you'll find that ultimately Lovely. there are no challenges. Nothing will challenge you. Ultimately. The, the, That's really the next program, maybe by the next program in 10 years. Uh, <laughs> and final <laughs> from, one? From experience. And, and the final one is, um, is um, what I call pass on. And, and this is uh, connecting with what Robert was talking about, is supporting another, is find a way to share what you're realizing. Find a way to give, basically, because our whole consciousness is, is conditioned to gimme, gimme, get, get, want, want, keep, keep. It's just like, that's how we've been programmed, how I was, I've been programmed. And I've spent 30 years freeing myself from that programming. And one of the ways is give, is pass on. Something you realize, something you have at some level of energy. It doesn't have to be the deepest wisdom. Just find somewhere every day to give something. And it loosens this habit of wanting to bring the world to me all the time. So I don't know, it might be useful for him. I want to say what stunning tips. Thank you, because that is exactly what you have both done today. Thank you so much to Mike George and to Robert Holden. Maureen Goodman is the Director of Programs of the Brahma Kumaris and has uh, I can't tell you how many responsibilities here uh, in London, in um, the rest of the UK, and responsibilities and duties around um, all over the world. Um, she's also very much of a coach to many people who bring their individual spiritual and personal problems to her, and she's always a great listening ear and um, a, a terrific coach. 
But um, what amazes me uh, most about Maureen is that with all these potentially heavy duties and responsibilities, there is a warmth and lightness about her. She is the embodiment of contentment and smiling. So I quite often have to look down and see if the feet are actually touching the ground or not. So well, I, with that, I shall just invite her to float up and give us her take on that. Come with it, Maureen. Om Shanti. Greeting of peace. I'm always a bit frightened of these introductions <laughs> because I have to live up to them. <laughs> but it's very nice to meet you all, and it's been just fantastic to hear Robert and Mike um, with Jackie, with Davina. And, you know, you may have thought you were coming to a program about happiness, but goodness. Haven't we had a lot of depth about really how to live in a way that is fulfilling and in a way that is not just keeping happiness to myself, but it really is sharing happiness. And actually, I just want to respond to the last question, if I may, about um, the person who, you know, that this whole thing of doing something so challenging a risk to life, like going behind enemy lines in the war, etc. And although, of course, haven't been through that myself, but have read the lives about the lives of people, and there seems to be a quality in what they do that has really gone beyond themselves. And it's not just a question of doing something, but it's like there's something in the soul that is driving them. They are doing something for a higher purpose. And perhaps they don't even, are not even consciously making a choice. But there seems to be something of greatness about them. We really live in a world where we need greatness. And there's not enough of it about. I suppose I wanted to start really sharing about someone who has been a great inspiration to me for happiness and her picture's actually here <laughs> and uh, she's somebody who was the head of our spiritual university worldwide until from, from 1969 when the founder passed on to 2007 when she passed on and you know we're, our university is headed by these incredible women, and one of them, uh, who is the head now, she inherited that uh, job at 91, at the tender age of 91, and she's actually coming next week, so watch out on your emails, we'll invite you, there's bound to be a public event with her. Um, she's 97 now, incredible, some of you met her, Daddy Janki. Um, but Daddy G had this this smile. She headed up this big organization. She had lots of things coming to her every day. And I would say to her, Daddy, it's like when you smile, the sun comes out. It was such a beautiful feeling, such a deep smile from the inside of her being. And it's because, as has been mentioned by our, our, my friends, it's because she was so truly, truly authentic that she would never ask anybody to do anything that she herself had not been through and experienced. And I remember once she was talking about leadership and she said, well, if you want people to respect you, then first respect yourself. She didn't say give respect, but first respect yourself. If you want people to love you, then first love yourself. And then she said that a leader is someone who's always alert and accurate. And the main quality of a leader is humility. And because she lived by that, she had true, true happiness, a great treasure store of happiness. 
And when I think about you know, how I've, I've moved on that path of happiness, I can't say that I'm happy all the time. There are times when it may dip a little. But if I compare what I was 30 years ago or whatever, there's a huge difference. And I think one of the keys is that, and again, I'm, I'm just really reiterating and expanding a bit on what's already been said, the whole key is about identity and that self that isn't you and the self that is you. And when we get into that false self, the ego, it's very much connected with what's happening around me, the relationships, and in particular, the roles that I play. How many roles do you play in life in one day? You know, you're a mother, you're a, a teacher, you're an employee, you're a consumer, whatever. Many, many, many roles. And the problem comes is when we identify with the roles and there's all the baggage of expectation that goes with them and the seeking of approval and everything else. And I know something that Daddy Janki talks about a lot is that if you feel at any point even the slightest bit of insult that you're being insulted by someone, it means that it's your ego that you're living out of. And in fact, there's a quote which I'm sure some of you have heard me quote before, which I love from Daddy. She said, well, it's a lack of wisdom to think that the one who praises you is your friend and the one who insults you is your enemy. Is that what your happiness is based on? Think about it. The one who praises me can manipulate me. I love praise. Don't we all love praise? <laughs> it's a big trap. The one who insults me is my best teacher. And, you know, the question, what's the purpose of the ego? Well, the only purpose I can see of it is that it's there to protect my weaknesses, my negativities, my vices. In other words, it justifies them all. Well, you, you had to get a bit angry because. So that's my ego. It protects the negativity inside. And uh, one of the best definitions of ego, is that ego I've heard, is from another one of these elder sisters. And she said once, and she's very humble. It's like she doesn't even know what ego is. I mean, how lucky. <laughs> and she said... Ego means E, go. <laughs> so that's a good one. I'm going to say that to my ego. E, go. Big E, get out. <laughs> or maybe, but order it with love, as Robert told us, not with, with hatred or anger. <laughs> ego, nice, mm, lovely ego. Off you go. So this thing of identity, and if you think about it, this whole thing of getting stuck in your identity is really what creates conflict, is what creates sorrow, which is, is what ultimately creates war. My territory, my religion, my, you know, and I loved what was shared. You know, we belong to each other. We're not little islands living separately. Yes, we need solitude at times, but that's not how we're meant to live. So this whole thing of identity, very important to come back to the true identity of the soul, of the being. And those of you who come here regularly will know that we talk a lot about this. Not just talk about it, we practice it. This is the foundation of our meditation practice. That I'm a soul. I'm light. I'm not my body. And if you say you're not your body, it means I'm not the roles, I'm not the baggage, I am me. I am that being which has treasures within. My original qualities of peace, of love, of joy, of wisdom, of power. 
And, you know, again, echoing what's been said, I don't think it's possible to have happiness without love. And this is another thing that's so important. It's the miracle of happiness. That happiness increases when you give it away. You know, normally if you give away something, then you may have less of it, but not with happiness. When you give happiness, when you share happiness, it increases for you. And this also brings us to the transformative power of happiness. You know, it isn't just for the self. And of course, we've been given many methods, what interferes, what it really is. But it actually is something that can transform an atmosphere and can transform situations. And, you know, when you walk into this house, I hope you feel the peace in the atmosphere, the happiness in the atmosphere. And it's because this is what we practice, this is what we share with each other. Yeah, it could be somebody has an off day at times. I don't want you to think that we're all perfect. Maybe by next week, not by this week. <laughs> but there's that practice of sharing happiness. And I agree totally that you can only share happiness in this moment now. You can't make it a thing of the future because you're already into expectations, you'll already get into disappointment. I remember uh, somebody asking me, they said, well, you know, I was sitting in the meditation room and I had a wonderful experience. I connected with God. It was so beautiful. So the next day, I went to sit in the meditation room at the same time, in the same spot, with the same shawl around me, and nothing happened. <laughs> I said, well, what were you expecting? <laughs> and then, of course, said, well, it's not about what you do. It's not about where you are. It's not about what you expect. It's not about what happened yesterday. It's not about what you'd like to happen in 10 minutes' time. It's about being here, present with yourself now. And so sharing an atmosphere of happiness actually enables others to begin to see solutions to their problems. And I've really experienced this. Um, when you're with people, you know, and, and often I do have the situation, of course, where people will come to me and something has upset them. And they're coming, you know, with a story or they're coming with a few tears or whatever. And, um, and I know I've, I've, um, I've moved in this because at first I used to think that I had to fix everybody's problems. Anybody else like that? You know, I've got to, you know, it's so great. And I'll, of course, what you're doing, you're, you're using them <laughs> to make yourself feel good. If I fix their problems, they'll like me, you know, and I'll be happy. This whole thing of feeding the ego with the approval, you know, that disease of people pleasing, it takes very subtle forms, very royal golden forms. I think I'm doing good, but I'm actually serving myself. So I used to think I could fix everybody's problems, which of course I couldn't. And if you try to do that, you just make them dependent on you, which is totally hopeless for them and for you. <laughs> but now I've understood. Listen, stay calm, stay happy. Don't start to get miserable with them. Because then you've got two people miserable. <laughs> Again, I remember a story from Daddy Janki and she was somewhere and uh, there was a woman at the, the back of the room and she was obviously quite depressed and and daddy was her usual you know very um, effervescent self and then finally this woman burst out and said what right of you to be so happy when I'm so miserable <laughs> and daddy just paused and daddy said to her well if I also become unhappy, who would there be to bring you happiness? And that just turned her mind around. 
and she started on an upward path out of her sorrow. So sharing that presence of happiness, it doesn't mean saying, oh, I'm so happy that you're sad. No, of course not. <laughs> but not losing your happiness, not giving it away. It's a treasure that you, well, I mean, give it away in the sense of that then you're sorrowful, but give it in the sense of it increases in the atmosphere. And um, I did have one very particular situation which was very amazing um, and I've spoken of this before but somebody who a good friend one of our sisters here but also a very good friend who um, passed away through cancer and this is now must be about I think it's probably about 15 years ago now but that whole journey was a big lesson for me because I was with her on the journey really accompanying her and I'd made that commitment you know sometimes when you really make a commitment to someone and I knew that to help her even in her suffering I had to stay happy inside and it took a lot of a lot of inner strength I really called on on God to help me but I knew it was the best thing because it created an atmosphere where she could maintain her connection with God. And, you know, these are times when even when you think it's, it's the most, you know, it's a time of suffering, as is being said, maintain your calm, maintain that contentment and you will really, truly be able to serve and of course, to have the strength to stay happy, we need the connection. We need the connection with ourselves, as has been spoken of so much, and has also been alluded to the connection with the divine. And, you know, that I asked Daddy Janki this very question actually about handling things. I said to, you know, people say that. Um, whatever comes to you in life, we talk about the drama of life, whatever comes to you in life is only as much as you can handle, is that right? And she said to me, no. <laughs> as you would expect daddies to do. <laughs> she said to me, no. She said, if that were true, what would be the meaning of God's help then? And that really opened up my intellect. And like you were saying, you know, it really made me say, if there's something in front of me, if I have faith, if I have trust, I'm not going to allow that commentary, as somebody called it, the health and safety commentary, you know, go on inside that, well, you can't do this because you can't, you're not, you know. I'm not going to allow that to stop me. And I'm going to say yes. And in that is our growth, is our transformation. And the more we deepen that connection, the more we feel that inner strength to be able to stay true to ourselves, even when many may be pushing us in another direction. Because there is very little truth in this world at the moment. There's a lot of deception. And when we try to live with that power of truth, there are many forces that say, you're mad, you're crazy. But I have to have that inner strength because what other hope is there for ourselves and for humanity than that? So I agree with Robert and Mike completely daily practice of meditation letting go of all other thoughts and connecting and emerging my original qualities and connecting with the source of peace, the source of love, the source of happiness. And, you know, it's when you start that practice, it's a little bit like, you know, igniting a spark. And as you practice daily, 
and it has to be daily, as has been said, and not just once a day, twice a day. And I'm really sorry, Robert, but the best time is 4 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Um, so if any of you want to come here at 4 a.m. tomorrow, welcome. <laughs> but then we do have other timings too, so you're okay. <laughs> but actually it's a time when there's no other activity, so the atmosphere is very, very conducive. But that special time to be with the divine, to be connected, it's a time to gain many treasures and many gifts from God. And so it's like igniting a spark, and then the spark grows into a flame, and then into a welcoming, warm fire of love, of happiness, of peace. And I know we'll have some practice of meditation in a little while, won't we? So thank you for coming here with your sparks and your flames and for the beautiful fire we're creating together. Om Shanti. Thank you.